All right, we are live. All right, welcome back. Welcome back, actually, in general. Spring break. Spring break just happened, and I'm very bombarded with a lot of things. But we had films to discuss. I wanted to see them because, well, a lot of things happened. A lot of things, um, entertainment-wise, did extremely well. The Oscars were great. I'm happy Oppenheimer won every single, almost every single award. Seven of the 13, including Best Picture, which was a wacky thing for, because I think Al Pacino was drunk when he did that. But I'm happy. I'm happy for that. I'm not happy the fact that Iron Claw did not get nominated for a single Oscar. That movie was amazing. And I'm just a little bit upset. Also, a lot of people thought Barbie was snubbed. And I can see. Um, it's a good film. But I don't think it's an Oscar caliber film. If you if you want to see my opinion, I would have swapped out Barbie for the Iron Claw because I didn't really expect a lot. But A twenty four has been hitting it out of the park recently. So yeah, we're gonna get into the reviews, um, and I think I want to talk about the January films because I think I remember I did some, I did a ranking. And I think I wanted to update the ranking a little bit because I do think that there have been films that I gave that I think I want to upgrade a little bit. But we are going to start with the new releases and work on our way then. So let's get started with Kung Fu Panda 4, which was directed by Mike Mitchell and is the fourth film in the franchise. It is an interesting one because it took eight years to make this movie, which... In that case, for an animated movie, I guess it's normal. But for a film that came out, for a franchise that has had almost like three years max within every single franchise film, uh, it felt weird. But nonetheless, we have Kung Fu Panda 4, and I was actually interested because I think Kung Fu Panda 1 is amazing. It's a nostalgic ride. I love the film, and it's very much so feels like a movie that has connected with me throughout my childhood, especially because it's just it's just such it's such a nostalgic film to watch. It's directed by Mike Mitchell, who has helmed Lego Movie Part Two, which was good, but a financial disappointment. In this film, he the story of this movie is that Poe is now Dragon Warrior, and he comes across now this new bad guy who is terrorizing villages, who is, you know, po poison as a posing as a threat, and you know he gets the help from a fox played by Aquafina to stop him to stop this chameleon played by Viola Davis, so he can be upgraded into spirit realm or the spiritual leader, I would say. <sighs> So the Kung Fu Panda movies, I've like I said, they've always been really good films. I have never hated a Kung Fu Panda film. I actually don't think they're mediocre at best. DreamWorks has always stayed true to the films. They've been funny, quirky. They've always had a good message with them and heart. And I was actually really excited. And I know a lot of people, older people, are really excited as well. I mean, I was, I think, seven years old when the original... Kung Fu Panda came out, and I actually watched it in theaters with my family and my grandmother, and I have watched the other two consecutively in theaters. And I have I did go see this movie um, because why not? And as much as I did want to keep the street going for mediocre Kung Fu Panda films, I think this is the closest to mediocre. It's not a bad film. I actually think this is a very okay-ish movie. There are things about this movie that I absolutely think are great. And then there are parts of the film that I think are absolutely not great. Starting with the good Jack Black. As usual, as this character, Poe, he really, you know, embodies this character. And I don't think there's really a single other person that sounds like Jack Black that can actually replace him. I don't know what they did with the, the whole miniseries on Nickelodeon. I never watched it, but... I don't think it was him voicing Poe, but 
he does a really good job in this movie as mm-hmm. well as every other character that I've seen in this movie. Uh, Dustin Hoffman as master Shifu was great. Viola Davis is having fun with this movie. She plays the villain and I love Viola Davis. She's just a, she's a gift from, she's a gift for acting. I would say she is, she's one of the greatest actresses right now. She's awesome. She was great in the woman came, which is a, an extremely underrated film that didn't make a lot of money. It did make over its budget, but it's an, it's an extremely underrated film. Definitely watch it. It's, it was one of my favorites of 2022. And so she's having fun with the film. And the animation, as usual, is fun. The action sequences are really entertaining. Particularly, there's one that really kind of sets the mood of the film where Poe fights this sort of stingray. And then something happens where the film kind of slows down. And we pick back up. And we're suddenly met with Aquafina's character, who at this point she could be in any other animated movie. She would I would not be surprised if she was in an animated film because I particularly don't hate Aquafina as an actress and as a person, but she seems to be popping up a lot in these animated films like Migration. She was in it. I forget the other films that she was in that I've seen, but I swear I've heard her voice before. Um, the bad guys, I forgot that was the one. So she's been in a lot and she pretty much plays Aquafina. She plays Aquafina as an animated character. It's just her quirkiness and her comedy. Some of it actually is funny. Some of it falls flat, which is a lot of the humor in this movie, which was sad because I actually like the humor in the Kung Fu Panda movies, especially with Jack Black delivering it. And there were some jokes that almost fell flat that I really didn't get and which was so confusing because I understand that the the Kung Fu Panda movies are made for kids, but there's a strong message with them that connects with adults and families. Kung Fu Panda 4 feels like a film that's strictly made for the kids and it's kind of sad. It actually did make the most, the second most money in the franchise, almost, almost more than the original. $57 $57 million and it took down Doom Part 2 and it even stayed on top in its second weekend dropping like 40% or whatever. My issue with this film really relies on two things. The first one is the story is considerably worse. It's a very straightforward story in which they have to bring in a new villain and for the sake of cameo sake, take other villains from the previous movies and sort of use their power. Because, no spoilers, it's in the trailer. Ian McShane returns as Tai Lung, and she takes his powers and has the ability to shapeshift into other enemies that Poe has fought against. So you see J.K. Simmons with the rhino, I forget the name of it. And then... The my favorite one, which was Gary Oldman with the peacock, the white peacock, and I again I forget his name, but those are like the ones where it's like, yeah, there's cam say for the sake of cameos that happens. So Ian McShane kind of comes in here and voices a couple of lines. It was nice to see him, but it really serves no purpose in this movie whatsoever. And like I said, the story doesn't really do much of justice for anything the humor is sometimes is flat and there are parts of this film that are honestly boring and then we get to the animation and this is one thing i noticed right away this movie cost 85 million dollars now the first three kung fu panda films all cost movies over 100 million there's a little bit of issue i have with this clearly It could be like we have to limit budget constraints or the fact that clearly they didn't really plan how they were going to make this because there are scenes in a movie where the animation looks good, but I can easily tell that the animation looked different. It it looked like it was a downgrade rather than an upgrade, which was kind of strange. And I understand that the film 
is is definitely a cheap movie. I mean, 130 million dollars or 150 million dollars is not is really kind of expensive, but for an animated film, under 100 is considered cheap. For any movie under 100 is considered cheap. It's just that you have to make back the budget. The biggest problem with this movie, I think, is easily the fact that it feels like they ran out of ideas and just had a forced fourth installment. Like Indiana Jones, the first three movies are pretty good. They're actually great. They're some of the best movies ever made. Even though a lot of people have an opinion on Temple of Doom and that film, there's really no exception that that's one of the best trilogies ever. And then they had to stretch it out with two more films that were completely unnecessary. Dial of Destiny and then um, Kingdom of the Crystal Stroll. Or maybe take the Toy Story movies. Except Pixar knows how to make a good fourth film. With Kung Fu Panda, they actually had a good record with the first three films. And then they had to kind of like they had to kind of Boo Wesley. <laughs> but going back to that, um going back to what I was saying, um it does feel like a fourth installment that's forced. You can tell that they're just kind of making the story very basic. Like he teams up with a stranger that nobody likes and has to defeat a villain. It's very strange and it feels so out of left field. It, it actually kind of annoyed me. I do enjoy this film. There are some entertaining moments in it. It's a very good looking movie and it's going to be a money maker because kids are going to love it. And there's a good message in there that just because you are what you are doesn't mean you get to change how you can, how your future is because we meet somebody who is a wanted criminal. And so it's kind of like, well, if you do this, you can change who you are and be a good person. And the messages are like that. That's very like basic, but it actually does work. But I wanted more. This movie, it's okay. I think it's okay. I'm more frustrated than most people. I, I think this movie is pretty fine, but in terms of a Kung Fu Panda rating, it's easily the worst. But it's not an atrocity that's like, it it, it ruins everything. It ruins the, the whole, the franchise as a whole, and it, and it ruins the characters. It, it doesn't do that. Also, they've been hiding the Furious Five a lot. I guess apparently the characters and the original actors didn't want to come back. It's not really a spoiler, but they do something that I also felt was extremely lazy with that. But then they explain it towards the end. Nevertheless, Kung Fu Panda 4, I think it's okay. It's nowhere near as good as the other three films, and it's nowhere near as good as Anime DreamWorks' Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, which was incredible. And I actually didn't even see their Ruby Gilman Kraken movie, which I can only assume was bad because it barely made money in the box office. This film, I think, is okay. And it's perfectly fine the way it is. There's nothing wrong with it. There's really... Nothing wrong with Kung Fu Panda 4. But if you are somebody that really, really, truly is wants a good story, I don't think you're going to like this one. I'm going to give Kung Fu Panda 4 a C+. Um, what else did I do? I almost had to sneeze. Oh, yeah, I do. <coughs> there you go. Um, I saw Imaginary. Now, this movie. Let's get into the review stance. Okay. Imaginary was directed by Jeff Wadlow and is the third outing with him and Blumhouse. They worked on Truth or Dare and Fantasy Island right before the pandemic hit. And this is the third time he has worked with Blumhouse to make another PG-13 horror film with a very cool concept. Again. This one is about imaginary friends, and it takes place wherever. I don't know where it does, but I don't know why I have to start out with this. But 
The movie is about Jessica, who is played by DeWanda Wise, who moves back into her childhood home with her new stepfamily and her stepdaughter, the youngest stepdaughter, finds a teddy bear. And she calls in her imaginary friend. She names it Chauncey. And they have fun together. And she starts to do things that are a little bit not normal. They're not like what children should be doing. And she grows, she grows suspicious. And we realize that Chauncey's actually a really messed up looking bear. This film is another one of those movies where the concept and the trailers that sell this movie are actually pretty cool. I actually was excited for this movie. It was on my most anticipated films of 2024 because I think the concept alone is great. Despite what I said about the director, I think this concept is amazing. And Jeff Wadlow has been handled concepts before like this. It's just that he decided to turn those concepts into PG-13 unscary films. And I have no idea why they keep bringing it back, especially because Fantasy Island has like an 8% on Rotten Tomatoes. And with this movie, Imaginary, that's the same thing. I found this film terrible. And I was really let down with this film. It feels like this guy just doesn't know how to direct a good horror film. And part of that is due to the script. I've talked about Madam Web and how it has really bad dialogue. This film almost can really be kind of a runner-up. The dialogue in this film is absolutely terrible and one that really got on my skin because characters just don't talk normal. Like, they just don't talk in the ways that they do. And most of the characters in this film are insanely stupid. But it's not even the characters. It's really the direction that this movie takes. And I didn't like it. Because the first 40 minutes of this movie aren't really set up. The movie doesn't set up anything scary. There's a lot of scenes in which they have fun in the house and then... The girl finds a teddy bear, and then they play. And then something happens, but after that, it's another elongated scene of nothing, and then we get into like the final 20 minutes, which actually have something of merit. But even that's like kind of boring. This film is horrendously boring. This is an hour and 44-minute film that feels like two hours. And I'm kind of getting a little bit worried that an hour and 30-minute film is like the new norm for two hours. And two hours feels like two and a half. Two and a half feels like three hours. Three hours feels like four hours. It's like the whole runtime, like shenanigans. It's not a stop. The characters in this film are extremely unlikable. You have the mother, the stepmother, who has gone through some things in her past, but she talks with her stepdaughter like she's been going through things. She says like, listen, I know you've been through a lot. We're going to get through this. If anything, you have had a traumatic past because in like the beginning scene, we see Jessica deal with something with, I can't even imagine what CGI they use because it's insanely cheap, but she apparently has a traumatic past and we find out what happens later on. And so There's really kind of no sense of emotion because literally the youngest daughter named Alice literally just like, yeah, okay, fine. I know. We're cool and stuff. The oldest daughter uh, is a teenager and I guess Jeff Wallow saw every teenage movie that was out there in the world and was like, yeah, she's got to be she's got to be mean to the mother because she pretty much dem- rep or like downgrades her stepmother in virtually every single way. And there's a scene even that's like the dumbest scene where she meets the neighborhood kid and he comes over because apparently she doesn't want to babysit. And she says like, Oh, the babysitter's here. And I guess he's older, like he's in college and the oldest stepdaughter is like 15 years old. And he's like, he has like a bag of Coke 
and he's like, let's have fun. And like the pills in his ton. And at that moment, I'm like, wait, so did you have the pill in the ton the whole time? Because uh, you would be, you'd be dead or you'd feel that dissolve. I don't know how pills are. I never done it, but I can only imagine that if it's been in his mouth for a long time, it's going to dissolve. But they do something with that character and you think like, okay, it's going to set the tone now for this film. But they don't. Instead, they try and like, they're, they're just like, yeah, we're, we're just going to, we're going to let that slide and stuff. And then the final 20 minutes of the movie are kind of where the film should have left, like should have started because it actually gets super crazy, but super crazy means limited because it's very limited on what happens in the film and barely anything happens. And of course we have to have a person in the film who is an old lady literally give an explanation on what's happening. There's an entire five minute sequence where she just gives nothing but exposition. It's so on the nose and so frustrating. I want to talk about something else that occurred to me after I watched this movie. And as a show called Martin mystery, this premiered on Nickelodeon. It was a great show. It was awesome. That show was about paranormal investigators in college or high school. I, I still forget where they are, but they're, young paranormal investigators that work for this agency called the center. And there was an episode called the return of the imaginary friend. And in that episode, there was a girl who used to have friends, but they grew up They're on the soccer team. And so they kind of separated from each other. And she makes a wish to maybe have those friends hang out with her again. And this revives a teddy bear from her toy chest. And that teddy bear ends up being evil. And that was the show. And then after that, I recognized like that's pretty much what happens in this film. A teddy bear comes in and is an evil teddy bear. And you have these characters that are there that you don't really care about. Like, I didn't care for the episode, but I cared about the story because I wanted to know, like, okay, what's the imaginary friend? How is it alive? How is the teddy bear even walking? Explain that to me, Nickelodeon. Well, it wasn't Nickelodeon. It was Canada. It was a Canadian show, but explain that to me. And then I watched this movie and I thought, okay, well, they're going to explain why Chauncey is a mutated bear creature thing. Uh, and they don't. It, it really just comes across as very cheesy. And the final 10 minutes of this film, look, I'm going to talk spoilers because I have to. I, I think there's some things in this film that are so stupid that don't really work. And it's going to involve spoilers. So if you want to see Imaginary Still, I guarantee you to not watch it. But if you want to, go ahead, skip this part of the stream. So throughout the entirety of the film, we notice that the youngest stepdaughter, Alice, is afraid of fire. Because there's one scene in which she looks at um, like a teapot. And Jessica's making some tea, or she's actually making brownies, I think it is. And she she makes brownies and she turns on the stove and like fire like comes up like like the heat starts to go under the pot and she kind of gets scared and you're like oh she's afraid of fire and then you notice like she has burn marks on her arm but they never explain why they never explain like why she has it it's just like yeah she just has burn marks. And so by the end of the film, when they're trying to escape the demon or like the entity that is trying to take them back to the imaginary world, a, a can of like, I guess, I guess, I, I don't know what it is, propane, I, propane, tank, I don't know, gasoline kind of like knocks over and spills on the floor and it spills on the demon, Chauncey. And I guess she like overcomes her fear because she's like, never, ever be your friend. And she takes a match and just throws it. And she burns down the whole house. So the message here is it's okay to let go of the things you love. But there's also things in the movie that they don't explain. Like, why was she afraid of fire? The biggest twist in the movie is the fact that Jessica actually had Chauncey as a imaginary friend. 
it's that she was, when she was young, she was taken to imaginary land and her father had to get her out. And we see that in a flashback and he becomes like blind and stuff from looking at to Chauncey's eyes and seeing like all the child's imaginations and she be- he becomes blind. And, and and they don't explain a lot more. This film is so into thinking it's a lot creepier than it is, which the design for Chauncey, like the 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 the, the actual entity for Chauncey, I thought was pretty cool. But that's another thing. They look like costumes. Like there's a spider creature that looks like it's a whole costume. There's the actual demon that's revealed, like the actual look for Chauncey. It looks like a it looks like a costume. It looks like a mask, and then it looks like a dark costume. The whole Chauncey bear thing looks like an animatronic bear with long arms. It looks like a costume, which is so insane to me. They could have gone more expensive if they wanted to. They could have spent like twenty million dollars instead of like ten to give it more of a good look for CGI. Because this film truly didn't work. And I am honestly kind of blown away. The one thing I can recommend with this movie is I guess you can say that DeWanda Wise gives a good performance. She actually is trying. She actually gives a good performance. And also, I forgot to mention this, the dad's nowhere to be found. He's on tour because they need like, okay, we don't have anything to write for the dad character. So we're just going to give him away. And he goes on tour. But what's interesting about that is, okay, so they burn the house down and Chauncey's dead. And he's on tour for like the whole movie. And we don't see like a scene where he's like, are you girls okay? What happened? What happened to the house? It's like, no, we just cut to the end. And then spoilers again, like they see another stuff bear and it's another kid where it's like, Mommy, Rufus moved, walked on his own, and he's not imaginary. And then you see, like, the actual Chauncey Bear, the the original Chauncey Bear that Alice found. I guess he changed his vests and appearance. This film tried so hard to be creepy. I never found the film scary. I never found the film intense and creepy. The creepiest scenes in the film are really them just being like, hey, there's a shadow in the background of the demon. They do that over and over again, and it got on my nerves quite a bit. This feels like a January horror film, yet it's in March. Actually, I think it was supposed to be in February, but it got pushed. I just don't know what to do. I, I really don't. And I'm, I'm nervous that Blumhouse is going to keep making these crappy, these crappy ass PG-13 horror films. That's another thing. You could have gone so good with the R rated, like... They had a chance to kill this boy because the demon kind of messes around with him. You could have done something there, but you don't. And so you kind of just like, wow. You really kind of, you kind of messed it up on that. I'm going to give Imaginary a D minus. Uh, it's basically what I expected. I also saw Damsel, the new Netflix movie on Netflix. This stars Millie Bobby Brown, uh, Angela Bassett, Robin Wright, Nick Robinson, and Ray Winstone. In this movie, movie, it's a dystopian fantasy film in which a princess is forced into marriage at a prince. And his family is quirky and nice. But she has to fight a dragon. Now, I'm actually going to tell you why I just said that because there's two trailers for this film. There's a teaser in which you see Millie Bobby Brown in a cave fighting for her life to survive against this dragon. That was a teaser. And actually, that was a good teaser. The second trailer of this film absolutely spoils some of the more important parts in the film. And so I'm going to give you a light spoilers in a way. That's her warning. So. In this movie, in Damsel, she is married by this kingdom that wants to have Millie Bobby Brown as her their princess. 
and she likes Nick Robinson because they're sweet together and they love each other and they're going to get married. But something shady is going on. And what's actually happening is she's a sacrifice because throughout history, women that have married Robin Wright's son have been forced to fall down in this pit and fight a dragon and survive. And that's the movie. She has to survive this dragon. Now, if you haven't watched that trailer yet, that pretty much gives you the sum up of the movie. So when the thing started to happen and secrets started to unravel, it's like, okay. Like, that's that's that happened. I wasn't really like, oh, oh my God, did you see that? Like that that just happened. Like I wasn't like I wasn't shocked. It was very predictable because the trailer literally gives you an idea of what the movie's about. If they had just shown that teaser and nothing else, I would have been like, yeah, this movie looks that kind of looks good. But they show a lot in the trailer. In that second trailer, though. Which easily bugged me because I, I like fantasy. I like these medieval films, but it seems like we've been getting the same damn movie over and over again. It's just that we have a bigger, much lower budget and a different cast. Millie Bobby Brown is actually really good in this film. She's she's really good. She's always been good in stuff like Nola Holmes, Godzilla, and The Stranger Things, which is where she kind of rose on the map. And in this movie, she actually is really good. The problem is we don't know much about her character at the beginning of the film. And I guess she's like a badass sort of thing because she survives the dragon which that's it but she is a very cool sort of i would say presence on screen she gives a lot of charisma she gives a lot of umph to her volume she's a great actress and she's easily the best part of the film angela bassett is in such a thankless role she's one of the greatest actresses of all time and right now how do you put her in a role this small. How? It's insane. To me. It's absolutely insane. The fact that she's in this movie. For like two minutes. Or five minutes. And they do something. That I was like. Oh if you do this. This movie easily fails. Like. They do something. That almost ruins her character. But they don't. And so when I watched the movie, I wasn't surprised that Robin Wright was like, yeah, I'm the villain. Like, I wasn't, I was never like, oh my God, did, did you see that? Like, I was never like surprised, which brings me to the script and the story. This is a very jumbled screenplay, which has limited dialogue when we're with Millie Bobby Brown. Because the movie needed an excuse for her to communicate with somebody. And so they actually made the dragon speak. I guess spoilers. That was a spoiler. They made the dragon speak. And they... they, did, 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 they, they I think they were lazy. Because the script is so poorly written. It's not a horrible script. But it's it's wacky. It there's immediately right from the beginning, I can tell the screenplay had characters doing dumb things. Like there's a scene in which a group of men are about to be attacked by the dragon, and the main knight is like, form a line, and they all form a line in front of him. And the dragon just breathes fire on all of them, and they like crumble into pieces and bones. And I'm just like yeah, do you know you have a, you're battling a dragon, which is insane, ridiculous. Um, it's very predictable, and that's the I think that's the biggest problem. You can't really guess what's happening, along with some truly off-putting special effects that I just noticed right away. It's a Netflix movie, but you expect a little bit more. I mean, there are Netflix movies that cost like two hundred million dollars that don't look as good as this or don't actually look better than this. If anything, the movie tries to have a message 
And the story is so basic and so kind of weak that I don't think that the message is out there. Now, there's a character in the film that plays her father, Ray Winstone. And he's not in the film that much, but when he is, I could easily tell he was shady. I guess, spoil again, spoilers. So, he pretty much signs a deal that's like, okay, you date your daughter to marry us. We sacrifice the daughter and we give you money. So the father's an asshole. Like, the, the father's a total asshole. He pretty much gives his, fa- his daughter away to death. But he does something so stupid towards the end of the film that it's like, why, why did you make the choice that you did? If anything, you could have saved yourself and you made the, the, the whole scenario worse. Like, unforgivably worse. You just pretty much shown that you are the dumbest character in this film in the worst way. I don't know. I feel like I'm trashing on this movie too much. It's not a terrible film. It it really just isn't a good one. The CGI is not convincing. The characters, some of them are just unlikable. And the plot is so similar to other films that have done it better. Millie Bobby Brown is fantastic in this movie, and she's great. It's just that everything around her was not as good. I'm going to give Damsel a C-. minus. All right, and finally we get to the last film, which is the best reviewed right now, and that is Ricky Stenicki, which is an R-rated comedy on Prime Video, and I forget who's directed from. I, 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 I might look it up. I don't know. Do I look it up? Yeah, look it up. It was directed by Peter Fairley and it is stars Zach Efron, Andrew Santino, uh, let me see, Jermaine Fowler and John Cena, as well as William H. Macy and a little cameo from Jeff Ross. There's that. And in this movie, three boys have made a pact together to keep bringing up this random name as a fake friend called Ricky Stenicki. They did something in their past, and they had to blame some random person on it that's make up. And so they go to Vegas to have a good time because they say, hey, by the way, our fake friend is uh, has cancer. And then they start to notice that people are a little bit like, wait a minute, why do you keep going out when Ricky's in trouble? You know. And so at this point, one of the friends says, well, actually, Ricky is going to be coming to the baby shower because one of the friends is having a baby shower. And so now they have to find somebody to play Ricky Snicky. In comes John Cena, who is a very good actor at doing interesting things that are not accepted on this podcast. But they hire him, they give him the money, and he kind of overtakes the job a little bit. He becomes CEO of Zach Efron's company and stuff. And that's that. Um, to be honest, I didn't think this movie was going to be good because I don't think comedies, especially on streaming, are really good. The one exception I can give is, I guess, Quiz Lady, which was fun and it was good. Uh, it was on Hulu. This movie is on Prime Video. Home of the Wilds, which, again, you didn't think I would stop talking about it, Prime Video. Give us a season three or else. No threats, just promises. But I actually found myself pleasantly surprised that Ricky Stenicki was not just an average comedy. It's actually a pretty good one. Um, There are also some problems with the film, but it's okay and good. Um, Let's say the things right out of the way. This film is hilarious. There are certain scenes that are funny. There are also certain scenes that are not funny, that are kind of like raindrops that kind of are like silent and they don't offer him long and i think the best comedy is with john cena and he has shown that he has a variety of things he's worked on r-rated stuff like the suicide squad and peacemaker he's worked on comedies like this one and blockers kids stuff like playing with fire which is brutal and i haven't watched it 
and it's terrible from what I've heard. But he has a wide variety, and he's also a freaking wrestler. John Cena, he's one of the best ever. And here he offers some comedy that I thought was actually pretty good. And, and normally, I don't like to say this, but sometimes John Cena in movies overdoes the comedy. He doesn't really do it here. He actually does a pretty good job of normalizing humor and emotion. And he has to keep this gig up before somebody's like, yeah, I actually know you're a fraud and you've just been hired by my 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 stepson's friends. Because one of the mothers gets a little bit suspic suspicious. Uh, Zach Efron and Andrew Santino and Jermaine Fowler, actually all three of the dudes have great chemistry. And their relationships with their partners also pretty good. And I would say the story element is pretty fun. It's funny that John Cena's like, yeah, I got a job to help out with your company. I don't know what I'm doing, but you guys gave me the script, but I, know, I, I, I think I know what to do. And so there's that. I think my problem with Frankie Stanicki is that it's it feels like there's two movies in one. The first movie is them hiring somebody to help out with their baby shower. And that could have been a fun road trip movie where they have to help John Cena. And then, like, you know, there's a, some people that are after him. And it's like, yeah, well, you got me at the wrong time because I actually did some shady shadiness. And I have to do something. That could have been fun. And then the second half of this movie is pretty much a business film where John Cena is now hired. And <laughs> Andrew and Zach are like, uh, dude, you don't work here. Get the hell out. That I thought was funny. But my biggest issue with the film is it's poorly paced. This film is almost two hours long, which is an hour and 55 minutes. Again, like I said, it's almost two hours long, and it feels like two hours. It's poorly paced. There are scenes that go on, I think, a little bit too much. And that's a problem for me because I am somebody that doesn't care for a long movie. But if it's a comedy, you want that runtime to be under an hour and 50, or better yet, an hour and 45 or lower. To have this movie be almost two hours, I think is a mistake, uh, a big mistake. And clearly, like I said, there are jokes that don't land and that don't work. But overall, I thought this was a pretty enjoyable film. It's definitely better than some of the comedies that we've had in the past and some of the comedies this year so far. Because there haven't been a lot that I've liked. But this one, I thought it was good. And because of that, I'm going to give Ricky Stanicki a B-. And I think that's going to do it for this stream. I actually going to end early because there's nothing really else to talk about. I actually think I'm going to hold on to January reviews until a couple weeks. Also, I will be covering Ghostbusters. I will be seeing Ghostbusters this weekend. But also, unfortunately... Uh, we won't have a show next Thursday because it's Holy Thursday. So that's happening. Also, uh, some of the movies to look forward to. I'm going to be reviewing Ghostbusters, Roadhouse, Godzilla and Kong. And I'm hoping to watch We the Pooh too. Not, not experience. Watch We the Pooh too. And that's it. Those are the movies I'm going to be talking about. And maybe January films. But other than that, I'm going to end it here. I hope you guys, thank you for watching. My name is Hunter West with the Western Star Movie Podcast, signing off. Thank you very much.